This video is on two by two tables. Two by two tables. Let's say you want to do a study uh, that looks to see how many smokers develop lung cancer. So you draw this nifty table out where you have the disease, cancer on top, and then you have the risk factor, smoking, on the side. And you realize uh, in 100 smokers, five people developed lung cancer. That would mean 95 people didn't. In 100 non-smokers, one person developed lung cancer. 99 people didn't. All right, this is your two by two table. Now, this is just a illustrative table for illustrative purposes, right? Your table might vary um, depending on what number you're using. So a generic table is just labeled A, B, C, D. And then you can plug in whatever number they give you uh, in your, your question stem, all right? So this is, just, this is a generic table, but this is a table we'll be using for our illustrative purposes for this video. This is a two by two table, you gotta know well. I don't actually like the two by two table. I like to make it a three by three table. Where I add up the population. So here we had 100 people. Here we had 100 people. Here you have six people that have cancer. Here you have 194 people that do not. All right. I make it a three by three table. And that makes things easier because sometimes you wanna see, okay, how many smokers develop cancer? Five. What percentage is that compared to the general population? So that'd be five over 100, okay? And sometimes if you don't do a three by three table, if you only have your two by two table, uh, when you're taking a test and the nerves get the best of you and you're just doing simple math, you might panic and instead do five divided by 95 as opposed to 100 and you get the question wrong. So just to avoid any confusion, I always make a three by three table that shows the general total population, okay? You can do it if you want. If it helps you, it helps me, all right? So just, just throwing it out there. You use the two by two table to help you with your research studies. And we talked about different types of research studies. We talked about experimental studies. We talked about observational studies, right? What are the different types of observational studies? You had case control. You had cohort. You had cross-sectional. Let's talk about case control first. Case control, you took people that had the disease and you looked backwards, looked in their history, looked in their charts, looked at previous risk factors. And one of the things you really wanted to look for is something called odds ratio. What were the odds of the person having the disease due to a previous risk factor? What are the odds of the person having that disease due to a previous risk factor? How do you calculate it? Well, you're going to take the people that have the disease, these people, and then see what are the odds it was due to that risk factor. So you're going to take the people with the risk factor divided by the people that didn't have the risk factor. Make that ratio. Cool. And then you want to compare it to a group that don't have the disease. So these people. You want to take the people that were exposed to the risk then compare it to people that weren't. And then you get your odds ratio. And you're thinking, that's really confusing. Is there some sort of generic formula I can remember to make things easier? Sure. So what do we do? We took this group of people, five divided by one. So that's A divided by C over this group of people, 95 divided by 99, B divided by D. If you cross multiply that, you get A, D, divided by B times C. That is your formula for an odds ratio. And that shouldn't be too hard to remember. AD, BC, that's how we come up with our calendar years, right? When someone says 3000 BC or 2017 AD, all right, that's how we come up with our calendar years. So AD over BC is the formula for your odds ratio. If we do the odds ratio for this, for, for our illustrative chart, we get something over five. And this is important because you need to interpret an odds ratio. Odds ratio over one means there's an increased chance of the disease due to risk factors. Makes perfect sense. Our odds ratio is over five. You have an increased chance of cancer if you smoke. We know that. We know that. Odds ratio equal to one, there is no difference. Whether or not you're exposed to the risk, you get the same rate of the disease. 
So in this case, this is not true, but in this case, it would, if you had an odds ratio of one, it would say you'll get cancer whether or not you smoke. We know that's not true, but that's what equals to one mean. If it's less than one, there's a decreased risk or decreased likelihood of getting that disease due to that risk. So uh, if you change smoking to exercise, if you exercise, you might have a decreased risk of cancer. Odds ratio less than one. So we talked about how you find the odds ratio and we talked about how you interpret it. Very important you know that. Next case control, talk about cohort studies. Cohort studies. What, do, what are cohort studies? So pause the video, tell me everything you know about cohort studies. Okay, give you a second, give you a second. All right, cohort studies, you take a group of people that have risk factors and then you follow them through the years and see if they develop that disease. See if they develop that disease. Okay. So let's see the people that were exposed to smoking and then see how many of these people developed the disease. So that'd be five people. So risk in exposed people equals five over the general population, over the population of smokers, 100. It gives you 0 0.05 or 5%. Now the generic formula of that is, what do we do? Five over the total. So that's A over A plus B. Cool. Then we wanna look at people that didn't smoke, didn't smoke, that developed cancer. Yeah, we get a group of people that didn't have risk factors, follow them over the years and see if they developed the can cancer. Sure enough, one person did. So that would be risk in unexposed. We had one person over 100 or 0.01 or 1%. What's the generic formula? What do we do? We do one divided by general, the population. So C over C plus D. Why am I actually explaining these generic formulas? Because a lot of times when people look in first aid, they see all these formulas and they freak out. They don't know how they got to that formula. They don't know what's going on. Now you kind of know. Now you kind of know. In cohort studies, you're really looking for something important and that's called relative risk. Relative risk. If you take a group of people with risk factors, what's the chance of them developing the disease relative to people that didn't have any risk factor, that had no risk factors? What's the chance of a group of people with risk factors developing that disease relative to people with no risk factors developing that disease? That's relative risk. What do you do? Just divide them. 0 0.05 divided by 0 0.01, easy. That gives you a relative ratio, a relative risk of five, okay? What's the generic formula for that? This divided by this. Okay. Now you might be saying, even in people that don't smoke, you can still get cancer. This poor soul got cancer. All right, so you can't attribute cancer solely, solely, solely to smoking. But if you want to, you're gonna to have to exclude this person. You're gonna to have to kind of cut him out, subtract him. And then that way you're left with people that only get cancer due to smoking. That is called attributable risk. This is a risk solely due to smoking. So we have to cut out this little outlier, this dude that developed cancer some other way. How do we do that? How do you think? We're gonna take the people that develop cancer and subtract this dude, 0.01. So we get 0.04 or 4%. 4%, 0.04 or 4% of people develop cancer solely due to smoking. We started with 0.05, right? But we realized there was some dude that had cancer from some other reason, all right? So we just subtracted them out, we're left with 0.04, 0.04. What's the generic formula for that? What do we do? Well, we subtracted this from this, right? Easy peasy. So if 100 people smoke, 
then four people will develop cancer solely due to smoking, nothing else. We subtract that dude out. 100 people smoke, four people will develop cancer. Fancy way of saying this is number needed to harm. The formula is one over attributable, attributable risk or one over 0 0.04. That means that equals 25. That means if 25 people smoke, one person gets cancer. We literally just said that. We literally just said that. If 100 people smoke, four people get cancer, right? If you just reduce that to 25 people smoke, one person gets cancer. That's the same thing. So uh, a lot of biostats is them asking you the same question, just wording it different. And because they word it different, now you have to use a new formula, okay? So don't get confused. Don't get confused. That is that. Our next topic is gonna be on something similar, but slightly different. Here, we did a two by two chart on a harmful risk, a harmful exposure, smoking. But we can have a beneficial exposure. How about exercise? Yeah. How about exercise? Let's say you wanna do a study that sees how exercise reduces your chance of getting a heart attack. So we do our nifty two by two table with the disease, in this case, myocardial infarction on top, and then the exposure, in this case, exercise on the side. That's how we always do it. You take 100 people, you realize that people who exercise, five of them develop a heart attack. That would mean 95 don't. You take 100 people that don't exercise, that are sedentary, you realize that 20 people develop a heart attack, 80 people do not. Now you know I don't like two by two tables, right? So we make a three by three table, just to add the population kind of simplify things. Here we have 25 people that developed a heart attack. Here we have, what is that, boom, 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 175. That didn't, that didn't. Calculate the relative risk for me. I'm gonna pause, I'm gonna pause, you're gonna pause the video and calculate the relative risk, all right? See if you remember what we just talked about. I erased it for a reason, that way you can't cheat. I'm gonna give you a second. All righty, ready. So we want to look at people that were exposed to this exposure that developed the disease All right. over the general population of five over 100 or 0 0.05. And we compare that over to people that didn't have exposure to that risk that developed the disease. So 20 over 100 or 0 0.20. That is your relative risk. And that leads to 0.25 or 25%. If you do not exercise, you have a 25% increased chance of getting an MI. A more optimistic way of saying that, if you like to see a silver lining, is if you exercise, you reduce your chance by 75%. How do we get to that number? We just did one over 25, right? Equals 75% chance. That is called the relative risk reduction. And the formula for that is one over the relative risk. So one over the relative risk, we got 75%, All right? So you have two ways of saying it. You can say, if you don't exercise, you have an increased 25% chance of getting cancer. But if you're optimistic, if you wanna see how the exposure reduces your risk, relative risk reduction, then you can say, if you do exercises, if you do hit the exposure, you reduce your risk by 75%. You get that number by just one subtracting the relative risk, okay? Now you might be saying, <laughs> even if you do exercise, five people had an MI. So you can't solely relate myocardial infarctions with exercise. Five people had it regardless. What do we do in that case? Well, we subtract that five, right? And then we're left with the people that only get MIs due to their lack of exercise. Kind of like how we did here, where we subtracted that one outlier that developed lung cancer that didn't smoke, right? We're gonna wanna subtract that here. We can't use this formula. We can't subtract five from 20, otherwise we get a negative number. So we just flip the formula. We'll flip the formula. C over CD minus A over A plus B. So we'll subtract it, 20 over five. And that equals 15. 
percent. That is your absolute risk reduction. That's your risk reduction that's solely, absolutely due to exercise alone. You subtracted that outlier, subtracted that outlier, you're left with your absolute risk reduction. And our last topic is, right up here, number needed to treat. Number needed to treat. Kind of like here, number needed to harm, but because we're talking about a beneficial exposure, number needed to treat. Here, number needed to harm was one over attributable risk. Here is one over absolute risk reduction, all right? Absolute risk reduction. And you get your number needed to treat. I think if we actually do this, we get something like 6.67. So every 6.67 people, I don't know that, what that even means, that you can get to exercise, you get one less mild cardio infarction. That is your two by two tables, your odds ratio, attributable risks, all this crap, all this stuff will be on my notes if you wanna review it. Hope that clarifies some things, thanks.